All right. Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming back for another Netbox community call. This is the May 23rd, 2023 edition. Uh, we're going to jump in pretty quickly here, uh, just saying that, um, well, we're really just welcoming everyone back, which I heard you did. Uh, but since this is a community engagement, we do like to make this uh, as engaging for everyone who's part of it. And we like to think of it as a little bit more than just a, a town hall and more of an interactive event. So for anyone who is willing, uh, we do like to see cameras on and hear voices throughout. We will have some presentations a bit later on where we'll have some uh, open Q&A as part of that at the end. Uh, if there are any questions, we'll save those for the end. Uh, we do have three great guests joining us today. Uh, we'll get into them a little bit later on, but first I'm going to start with our community news because we have a lot in there this month. So kicking that off, we have the 2023 community survey that is still open. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to take that, uh, we would definitely appreciate that. It's a good way for the Netbox community to help us understand a little bit more of what's going on out there with the user base, what industries are out there, uh, an easy way to provide a little bit of feedback in terms of the direction of Netbox. Uh, it's, it's something that you'll see us do every year. It runs through uh, the end of May. Once it's done, we'll take those results, compile them, and bring back a, a pretty nice survey and a summary of all that information. And you'll see us advertise that out through Twitter, through Slack, uh, on, on GitHub. That'll be all over. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Cisco Live is coming up. Uh, Jeremy and I will both be at Cisco Live. So we won't have a booth per se, but we do have a Calendly link uh, that if anybody is going to be there, wants to book a little time to chat about Netbox, uh, just generally catch up, say howdy, hey, uh, we'll get that link put out there as well. So you can uh, book some time on our calendar. Uh, the next two things, Jeremy, I'm going to ask you to, to talk a little bit about. So let's start with the plugin idea board, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks. Um, also, yeah, looking forward to Cisco Live. That'll be, uh, it was a lot of fun last year. Looking forward to going back. And uh, I'm actually working on putting together some little custom swag that I'm going to keep a secret for now, but I think it'll be pretty cool. Um, yeah, so moving on, the plugin ideas board. So as most of you probably know, uh, we've had support for plugins in that box back since, oh gosh, I don't know, probably 2.10, something like that. So plugins have been around for a while and we're seeing more and more of them. And, and more recently we launched the uh, plugins registry, kind of a list of, of well-known uh, popular community plugins on that box.dev. So that's there. You can take a look at that. Uh, but to date, we haven't had a great answer for people who want to propose and discuss a plugin other than saying, hey, yeah, this you know, sounds like a cool idea, go start a GitHub discussion. Of course, those are kind of hard to keep going and they're hard to track over time. Uh, so what we've done is put together a, a, an idea board, uh, which uh, essentially is a, a forum for people who want to propose a plugin uh, to, to write up you know, a brief summary of, of the idea and submit it. And then it's uh, kind of got like a Reddit style voting where people can, um, can upvote ideas that are intriguing to them. And uh, the idea being that the, the more popular plugins kind of float to the top and people who are interested or, or face the same kind of use case or challenges can comment and help shape the idea behind the plugin. And ultimately people can go about building it. Uh, so we're launching that now. It's the URL is uh, plugin-ideas.netbox.dev. Uh, we did a book, like a really quiet soft launch last week just to test out the platform and everything seems to be going well. Uh, you'll see there's a number of ideas in there already. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. It's pretty cool. Um, upvote any any plugins you see uh, that are interesting to you, and of course, uh, you know, encourage everyone to submit your own ideas. Um, first, checking to see if someone else has submitted something similar, of course. Uh, but I'm really excited to see how that how that goes, and um, I think we'll be doing more with that in the in the very near future. So again, that's uh, plugin-ideas.netbox.dev. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. And I, this this uh, session is going to be a little link heavy, so we'll make sure that we put all the links out there uh, through chat and then through the uh, follow up emails that come out of this for everyone who signed up. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, next, you want to do you want to say the words or you want me to say the words? I'll let you I'll say the words. words. I'll, you I'm, say the words. I'm OK with some of the words. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, so the, the next point coming up is the um, technical. Uh, so the NetBox Advocates program. So some of you may remember we kind of started down this path around this time last year, um, which is uh, the, the idea behind this is putting together a self-selected group of NetBox power users that can help drive the the uh, direction of the project and kind of where we focus and provide feedback, uh, very you know curated, crafted feedback on on specific areas of the application. Now, obviously, we can do this with a greater community. We can always ask people, uh, and people, if you're on GitHub, you know people have no problem telling me what I've done wrong and and what I should be doing instead, um, which is fine. But sometimes we need to have a more uh, like a deeper discussion, and it's very hard. To have to achieve like a depth in discussion when there's a lot of people talking as as you'd expect. So the idea behind this is that it becomes a semi-private group of self-selected power users. So people who are not just using Netbox, you know, occasionally, but people who are in there every day, they're using the the advanced features, the customizations, maybe they're writing plugins, their custom scripts and reports and so forth. And people who who really know the, the application well um, and are are well positioned to tell us, you know, what what they want to see next from it or where they want to see it go what are their challenges uh what use cases can we address in there uh so the idea behind the advocates program is people can sign up for that um you may have caught it uh, maggie actually posted a, a blog a blog article about this uh last week on netbox.dev so the article is up there as well but just very briefly um we'll do things like we'll have a private slack we'll send out recurring surveys uh, for people that are targeted more toward specific topics. So like right now, Jordan mentioned, we have our, our broad community survey, which is open. That's for the month of May. Um, and that's an annual survey. These will be more frequent, more targeted. Uh, of course, you don't always have to participate in them, but if it's something that's that's interesting to you, that's um, we ask that you you know, try to give us this feedback. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it uh, very short and very, very pointed. I'm, I'm not a fan of long surveys. Um, We've all been there where they say, hey, you recently spent $4 at a hardware store. Can you spend 30 minutes telling us about your experience? No. But uh, for things like specific features, like we, um, well, as an example, oftentimes people will say, you know, does this make sense as a plugin or should it be a core feature? And that's something that, that we'd love to discuss more with people. You know, some things, um, even though they might be appropriate for the application, might be too much to tackle. Uh, so figuring out kind of where that line is, and it will shift over time inevitably, but we'll we'll lean on the advocates group to help us with things like that. Um, so if you're interested, um, there will be a link to sign up. It's on the blog article there uh, on netbox.dev currently, and we'll throw that in the bundle of links for this call as well. Um, so check that out and um, yeah, let us know. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm really excited to see where the uh, the advocates program goes. It's it, It's nice to have alternative ways, additional ways to engage the community for feedback. So that's, that's Absolutely. great. Looking forward yeah. to it. Cool. Um, so for the last one, I'm going to invite Mark Coleman on to give us an exciting update. And I'm not going to say any of those words, Mark. I'm going to leave it all on you. Uh, but you do have to come off mute first. That's still not. You're still muted. Mark, are you there? Hmm. I wonder if he lost audio. Uh, Mark's there in live, yeah. Yeah, I see him. Oh, mute is down. Hello, there you are. Uh, we're in we're in a co-working space and uh, yeah things are happening. Hello everybody. Um, so uh, Jordan, I I did think we were going to talk about this at the end. Did we change the plan? Uh, sorry, not the end of the meeting. I just wanted to have it at the end of the the community news block. Okay, yeah, got it. Cool. So just to go ahead, so I've got some very exciting news for you today. Let me just read from the blog post for a minute and then I'm going to share it. Um, one of the reasons why this is exciting for all involved is because it went online. 20 minutes ago. So you are literally the first people on earth to hear about this. And hey, Mark, before you jump too far into it, could you uh, introduce yourself so everyone knows who we're talking with? 
Yeah, good point. So my name is Mark Coleman. I'm the Chief Product Officer uh, at Netbox Labs, uh, and I'm based out of London. Short and sweet enough? Short and sweet enough. Thanks. Awesome. So um, let me read from this. Uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, network automation is hotter than ever, but to date, there haven't been any real practitioner-focused events to bring the community together. We've been listening, and with the help of the Netbox community and the broader network automation ecosystem, we're going to make it happen. Net DevOps Days is the event for network automation practitioners. So broadly, what have we done? Well, we've been thinking a lot about, obviously, we have various forums to talk about Netbox and Netbox-specific things, but we've been really impressed by the quality of some of the content, which is Netbox uh, Netbox related, but network automation related. And we wanted to come up with a place where we can have conversations around when network automation is going and only where network automation is going. Um, the main plan is ambitious. Uh, we're moving at a real clip here, but as you can see, we're gonna do the first net DevOps days in London in the week of June 26th, so a month from now. Um, I'll post a link in here for a minute. Oh, somebody already did, great. Thank you, uh, Ed. So the basic idea is um, we are bringing together a maximum of 100 people in London at the end of next month. We're gonna do the same thing in New York later in the year. And we've already had a fantastic response from the community with regards to potential speakers and people who are gonna sponsor us and help us make this happen, help us think through the whole thing. So we are uh, launching this today. And what can you actually do today? Well, to do, today you can express your interest. So you'll see a couple of links in there to a form where you can go and give your email address. As I said, this is moving at quite a clip. So if you put your email address in there, we will um, get back to you with details around the speakers uh, that have been arranged and some of the other content that you'll see on the day, and then also how you can register. So I would encourage you to take a look at the blog post that was kindly shared a moment ago, um, sign up, and also share this with anyone else based in London or New York who you think might like to come and hang out with us either at the end of next week or sometime in Q4. Um, like I said, we're moving pretty fast, so the news is going to be coming thick and fast uh, uh, just behind it. Get your email in and you'll learn as it goes, and that is going to be um, on a probably daily rate for the, next of this week, uh, for the rest of this week. Um, I guess I'll pause for questions, though. Uh, I, I, I don't have any other than just to say I'm excited. I like the fact that we're getting this out there. I'm seeing <laughs> some chat here. Um, Netbox hoodies, show me the swag. That seems like a very good plan, Ed. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> One thing I'll just <laughs> mention guys quickly um, beyond, not, not quite a question, but uh, you know, one of the things we'll follow with quickly is some of the lineup and some of the activity uh, we expect to have at this event, which is hot. Um, it's really great already. Um, we have a great group of folks contributing here, so it uh, should be really fun. Awesome, thank you, Chris. All right. Um, so moving on, we're going to go ahead and uh, if we do, if anybody does have any questions, um, we'll, we'll have some time at the end. We can open up for open Q&A, uh, but let's go ahead and jump in and start getting into our presentations. So we have three presenters this month. Uh, we have Ian Underwood, we have Austin Decoup crank and Timo Rassan. They're each going to be presenting on something a little different they're using that box with. Uh, so Ian, I know you're doing some open gear terminal scripting. I'll go ahead and hand off the presentation to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you and good morning. My name is Ian Underwood, and I'm a network analyst on the network design and architecture team here at Boston Children's Hospital. And I've been with the team for about six and a half years. What are the odds? Um, my primary responsibility is the design side of the hospital's campus network. So this pretty much covers all of our clinical, administrative, and research spaces supporting our institution, 
which supports over 17,000 employees and associated personnel. So what I'm here today is to present one of the ways we're using NetBox to solve a problem at Children's Hospital. So um, we're going to call this uh, NBOG. Um, it's essentially NetBox plus Open Gear. And it's the command line Python script, um, which integrates the data we have in, network, in NetBox and allows us to use the full function set of our Open Gear terminal servers. For a little bit of history, we first introduced Open Gear into our network in 2017 as an upgrade path away from aging and unsupported platforms. Uh, these were primarily supplied by digital, yes, really, uh, and Cisco routers with asynchronous serial network modules, um, both of which have been long unsupported. The following year, we started to reintroduce fully managed PDUs into our network. Uh, we've used PDUs for many years, but we wanted to be able to manage and control them remotely. Um, on a per outlet basis. And we have a multi-vendor PDU environment, uh, mostly out of equipment made from APC, Vertiv, and Baytech. In 2020, we first started looking at NetBox as a candidate replacement for our previous documentation methods. Uh, these include Excel sheets, uh, various locations, stored in various locations, um, some including SharePoint, other file-based storage, and any of the other CMDBs we were had available at the time weren't really friendly or suitable to the task. So after some time putting data into NetBox, I started to wonder if it was possible that we could build some glue to kind of bring these things together. And that has been the case. Um, but for this, let's define the problem. So the Open Gear does a lot. It's one of the reasons we selected their equipment as our standard bearer. Uh, obviously, console access was the most important part ourselves and networking and other departments have come to rely on console access via uh, secure shell, TCP raw sockets, uh, telnet, yes, still. Um, however, there were a couple of new features that were previously unavailable. Um, we could define security groups, which allows us to control access via TACAX. We had the now had the ability to work with managed PDUs, so allowing us for power cycling when remote hands are not available and an integrated menu set so we could send proper breaks and do controls from within inside the console itself. Also, configuring the end port for initial needs out of the box was dead simple. Uh, for doing any kind of a replacement, that was kind of an important piece. Now, as far as bringing all those components together, not so simple. Well, it's easy enough to define a system making sure the system has the proper outlets, serial ports, and security groups all tied together is an exercise in tedium in a process that has cried out for automation since it was first introduced. So we never really used any of the features before uh, NetBox really came on the scene. So uh, this is how we did it. The first part and the longest to execute was getting the data into NetBox. So that required considerable build out of our facilities in data center and on campus. Of particular interest for the open gear is the cable plant and all the supporting infrastructure that ties all that equipment together. With the information in place, coming up with a script to build out the required configuration would also take some time. Um, in the first run doing this, we used the RAML API that open gear provides. However, that is limited really to only the console ports. Um, but it was enough to kind of get our feet wet with the idea. The second run, which is in this the, this component I'm talking about, execute all, executes all the changes via the Open Gear CLI and gives us access to the entire boat. So in a series of loops within loops, the system does a, a couple different things. Um, configures all the serial ports with all the parameters that are defined on the console port of the remote device is connected to. Uh, we use a series of tags to define non-default parameters. So these are like a wiring mode change between, let's say, Cisco straight and Cisco rollover. Um, we also support non-standard parity with a couple random devices. It'll be like 72 um, and a couple of other non-defaults. This also configures the RPDUs on the open gear. Um, and we use a, a tag that's applied to the platform. So as long as the RPDU has a primary IP, and a platform with the um, an OGRPC tag, then the RPDU can be added. And then finally, security groups are also defined. So within the script, I use a slug map to 
um, take the slug of a security tag and apply a, an equivalent um, component in the open gear that is used by Secure ACS. And then finally, all the permissions have to be rolled up into a system, which contains all of the things, the ports, the outlets, the security. Um, the thing allows all our admins to see everything, but now the individual groups can see their own devices and manage them. So, I mean, there were some challenges, obviously getting the data integrity and making sure everything was in is kind of a new process, not having everything in the network-based CMDB before. And so that's the most important. We also had a couple of bugs too. So we found that uh, if the open gear wasn't in at least 14.3.2, uh, we would lose permissions for access. And that's a bug that was fixed in the release notes. Um, in tying into integrity component, we had to add additional data uh, to some of the builds because we've been building in NetBox for a while. So not everything had a platform definition or an IP added to it. Um, we are primarily an info blocks shop. So that's where all the IP info re really lives. So we had to kind of pull in some of it there. Um, and then loops within loops. I think anybody that's done any kind of development, uh, once you get a couple loops deep in, it can be a little confusing to kind of keep up with that. So uh, for an unconfigured system, uh, a first run will take over 1600 command line changes. And the, it takes about between 15 and 20 minutes to process, but it can go up to a half an hour. So there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, and then there's just the last part of data constraints that we had to be aware of. So ports in the open gear had to be named exactly as they're defined. Um, on the PDUs themselves, the outlets had to be numbered in sequence. So we got a little creative with labeling when we first started um, defining device types and those kinds of groups. So um, had a little bit of cleanup to do. But once all that stuff was done, it was, kind of, it was go time. So I'm going to do a, a, a quick part of the demo here. I'm going to show some of the updating script. Um, and then I'll show you a couple of things on what it looks like and what uh, we can do. So um, here I've got a, my terminal server up. So I have the, um, the it's just a NBOG CLI. I'm already in my, uh, my VENV. So I'm going to be using um, one of the terminal servers that I've had to do a, a couple of things on. So really all I do is specify the uh, terminal server. And it goes and talks to the NetBox database and it looks for, do I have a device with this name? And does it have a platform and an IP? Now, if I leave that off, the script will go through and process every terminal server I have um, that's properly defined in the system. So I could let this run and it will go through every terminal server. It'll check every port, every PDU, every security permission. Um, with this particular run in the command, it doesn't, it's not um, making any changes, but it's trying to figure out what it's going to change. And at the end, it will uh, generate an output. And this takes about a minute and a half, two minutes to run. So while it's doing that, I'm gonna um, hop on over to one of my terminal servers here. Um, this is the uh, one that I've, I've been primarily working on. And I'm gonna log into this with kind of a limited account. So, um, not Underwood is one I use for uh, testing uh, on campus with different permissions. And this one is limited only to things that are stuffed into like a network administrator type of role. So through Secure ACS, it says, okay, you've got the security group for networking for the open gear. You're not an administrator. You don't have any of the things. So what, it sh what I have available to me is every, uh, every switch here, uh, I've got both ports because they're all they're all dual soup, and then all of the outlets that are available to me on each of them. And through the updates on the open gear, these keep track of what the outlet states are um, roughly every minute. And we can see here that there are a couple that only have two power supplies. So this is kind of what the other script in the back end is taking care of. So I can go through there, and now it's doing its part of the PDU loop. And what it has done is it has put up a list of changes that it's proposing. Um, so this is every point on the command line. So it's gonna tell me what, uh, what those things are. Um, 
as it turns out, also includes my SNMP write community. So I'm not going to dwell on that one too much. <laughs> um, but to uh, give you a, another idea, I'm going to log into this one um, as an administrator, um, partly because there's a widget bug on the open gear that I'm working through with them. Just to show you a little bit of a difference in the information available on the UI, if I get my password right. Ian, just so you know, we're we're getting kind of close to time there. Yep. All right. So, so uh, I don't know what's wrong with it, but let's see. Um, but I mean, that's that's really about it. Um, I've got a couple things I'm looking at in the future, so. Um, just to allow devices to be configured uh, for ports if I don't have a connection. It's not everything does. Um, looking at doing an open source release to GitHub once I get some stuff out of the code, um, along with appropriate documentation. And possibly in the future, looking at doing a, building out the XML config directly instead of using the command line. But it's much faster, but it's kind of risky. Uh, bad XML brick the system, which certainly be... Um, unfortunate, and then potentially something with automatic updates, whether it's a periodic cron job or um, web hooks. So that's kind of a lot to shove in there. So um, that you can, they can hang around after for anyone that has any questions, but. Yeah, I think that's uh that's, that would be great. It looks like we've got one or two questions in there. Um, Ed has one that's a, Looks like it might be a bit more detailed. So if you're okay, let's uh, let's hold questions um, for Ian until the end. We'll uh, let our other two, we'll let uh, Austin and Timo go through, and then um, we'll, we'll open that back up for questions across the board. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it, Ian. That's very nice. I, I have some questions as well, so that'll be good. Uh, Austin, uh, if you are ready, go for it. Awesome. Thanks guys for having me. So I'm gonna just quickly go over kind of an overview of what I'm doing here in a slide deck and then we'll jump straight into a demo. So the, the, the topic really wasn't that clearly explained in my first, when I first signed up here. So basically what I'm trying to do is manage my NMS exclusively through Netbox using webhooks. So the goal is We've got a few goals. Uh, first is centralization. So I want to keep everything in Netbox. Uh, and if Netbox is not the source of truth for some kind of information, then we at least want Netbox to reflect that truth. Um, or if it can model that intent or that truth, then we want that to happen. And really also just want Netbox to be a single pane of glass for as much as possible. It's not ever, ever going to take over everything, but whatever it can, that's what it should do. I'm also looking for an efficient approach here. So uh, we don't want to duplicate any effort. You know, as we onboard devices in Netbox, that's already got enough of a process. We don't want to have to duplicate that for our NMS as well. And because the process is so fairly involved, we also don't want to really think about it. I don't want to have to wonder, did I forget this step? Or, you know, um, did I do something incorrectly? I want to have as much of that automated as possible. Uh, also looking for uniformity, so keeping everything in sync, um, and ideally in real time. I thought about doing a script that would run you know, nightly, and I thought, that doesn't really work, because now we've got you know, 10, 12 hours potentially between when a device goes into production and when we're actually monitoring our NMS. So we need it to be real time. And I also want this solution to be boring. Um, boring is simple. Uh, boring is reliable. Boring is really what I think every bit of production code should be. Um, you know, it can be exciting to implement. Um, it can be exciting to kind of connect the dots, but the ultimate end result really shouldn't be uh, more than just what it needs to do and to do it well. So my approach um, involves a set of custom fields that model all of our SNMP, or rather our, all of our monitoring fields. So that includes um, our monitoring protocol, so we can either do ICMP or SNMP, um, and then also any other things like the either the name credential set if we're using V3 or the community string if we're using a V2. Uh, we also have, falling right on the heels of that, is a set of custom validators to make sure that those custom fields are correct. What I'm doing there is also making sure that 
all of the devices that should get monitoring fields um, set actually do have them set and they're set correctly. I'll demonstrate those in just a minute. Uh, of course, the meat and potatoes here is the webhook. Uh, and I've enabled that both on devices and VM object types for creation, updating, and deleting those events. Those are all fire off a webhook. Uh, those are then consumed by a custom webhook processor, um, basically just a Flask app that I have running on one of our VMs that uh, receives that webhook and then processes that into API calls for our NMS. And then finally, we have some tags that I'll show you what they do in a little bit. And the results, pretty straightforward, uh, pretty boring. Uh, Real-time state sync, uh, host name, IP, any changes there, they get updated. Uh, site region and even geolocation, so lat long, that'll show up in our map. I, I can't demonstrate that in my lab today, but um, in prod that it'll show up uh, actually on a, on a map based on the um, lat long in Netbox for the site. Um, polling method, uh, you know, again, whether it's ICMP or SNMP, and then any SNMP details, all of those can be changed directly in Netbox and they'll reflect uh, in real time um, in SolarWinds. So let's jump right into a demo. So here we've got a, a mock-up here in my dev environment. Uh, my security team was very good at their job and they asked me to redact basically everything. So we've got R2-D2 sitting here on Tanev 4 which is the spaceship in the beginning of the first Star Wars movie, uh, in the outer rim, and he's pointing at Google Public DNS. Didn't even want me to point to a, a lab machine. Um, then we also have a totally vanilla SolarWinds instance over here. Um, everything that's going to show up will show up in here, but at this point, there's absolutely nothing. Um, so the first thing I have, uh, if I go to notice, we'll notice here is that uh, he's in plan state. I've already mocked up everything else here, and he's got nothing in the monitoring fields for um, these custom fields. Uh, so if I decide to move him from plan to active, and I just ignore all those monitoring fields, I'm gonna get an error. It says this device or VM requires NMS monitoring. Uh, so I have to set the polling method because this is a router and when status is set to active or staged. So there's some granularity there. We don't always have to have monitoring fields defined. It's only for those devices that require it. So I say, okay, fine. Um, I'll do SNMP. Oh, guess what? You can't just give me SNMP. You also have to give me an SNMP version. And the same thing goes on if I give it SNMP v2, but I don't give a v2 read only or read write community string, then it also errors out. Because I have to use uh, Google Public DNS and they don't respond to SNMP, uh, for the sake of node creation here, I'm just going to use ICMP and we'll play with these in just a minute. So at this point, he is active and he has ICMP. We don't get an error. And in just a minute there, if I refresh this page, I now have a SolarWinds ID. So the webhook now gave me the unique ID in SolarWinds, which then also is fed into a custom link, which gives me this button right here. So I can now open directly the link to SolarWinds. And for ICMP nodes, there's really not much to see here. I mean, there's really nothing to, to monitor except for response time and packet loss. We go to edit node here and confirm. Well, you don't even have to see that, but you can see that ICMP is the set polling method and there's really nothing else to see. Uh, now that it's created, actually, before I jump over there, let's go back to the home screen. If I refresh this, you can see that we've now inherited uh, not just R2D2, but also his site and region. So that's all there. Let's go back to here and let's make some changes. So now that it's created, I can actually switch it to SNMP without any issues. Uh, let's do V2. And we can provide both a read only and read write community string. For now, I'll just use uh, read only. I go back over here, refresh this page. We now see that we're at V2C. We're using default and the community string I set. If I go back over here, change to 
v3 we can actually leave the v1 and v2 community string because those will still be there for if we switch back to v2 but say v3 let's just create a, a name credential set and what's cool about the v3 is that i'm just mapping on a name credential set um, i'm not actually storing any secrets or any other parameters all that's stored privately in solar winds so i refresh over here you'll see we go to v3 and we have all this pre-populated uh, some other things we can change um, we can rename them to c3po and we can put them put them on tatooine oh i already have c3po somewhere so we'll just we'll do r5 v4 And then if we, sorry, zoom's in the way here. Refresh here. We'll see that we are now in Tatooine and we're now called R5D4. So all that's really straightforward. Um, again, hopefully boring. Like hopefully it's just so straightforward. You don't even think about it. Um, one last thing I'll show is um, managing status. So when I go from, active to um let's say offline that's a, a state that we actually don't use that much um but if we did it would unmanage the device so if we refresh this it's not unmanaged you can tell by this little blue x right here that means we're no longer collecting any statistics um it hasn't been deleted of course from solar winds but it's for all intents and purposes, it's not really there. Um, again, we don't use that state very often, but it's there if we need it. Um, let's go back to active. Make sure that syncs all right. And it'll stay gray for a minute while it's pulling and making sure that everything is okay there but uh, last thing i'll show is we also have tags for managing things like maintenance so again idea being netboxes are single source of truth um, all of our intended state is modeled somehow in netbox and that means that even devices that are under scheduled maintenance that's somehow reflected in netbox so that way any scripts that might be running can you know maybe um, exclude them and say oh i see they're under maintenance so there's no point in trying to pull a config backup for example if it's possibly offline if i do that um hit save you actually won't see any real difference here um because what we do is we put the device in i think what's called suppressed alert mode and you don't really see that here um, on at least an icmp hold node or, or non snmp enabled node but you can kind of see right here if i go to maintenance mode i now have the option to resume alerts and so that means that everything is as like it's bau within solar wind so all of the status um, updates will happen as usual, but um, they just won't fire an alert. And the same thing happens, the inverse rather happens when we take the netbox or the maintenance tag off. And finally, um, to complete the life cycle kind of demo here, uh, when a device moves into um, decommissioning stage, at that, that point it has been fully removed from production and it is removed from SolarWinds. So um, take a second to upgrade or update that. Notice that we no longer have our SolarWinds link here because the SolarWinds ID value has been cleared. And if we go back to our SolarWinds, we're back to nothing. Wow, Austin, I mean, that's phenomenal. I, you're running a little bit long there. I just, I kind of wanted to let you wrap that up though, because that's, we get a lot, I, I hear a lot of questions out there in the community. It's how do I integrate Netbox with this tool or that tool? And to see a pairing of Netbox and SolarWinds like that, which is a, a very popular tool out there. It's great to actually see it in action. So I assume there's going to be some questions on that. Um, but let's, again, we'll table those with Ian sure. towards the end, but I really appreciate you coming on and, and demonstrating that for us. It's phenomenal. Awesome. Uh, so our last presenter is Timo. Um, 
go ahead and let you come on. And just because I have fun pronouncing your last name, I'm going to go for it. So I was a, a rest. <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. Just a minute. So can you see the screen? Yes. So I'm Timo Rasanen. I work uh, as senior cloud engineer at Nokia, and I'm based in Finland, and I have a networking background. My presentation today is about the data center automation and how we use Netbox as a sort of tool in our infrastructure. And in this presentation, I'll tell you briefly uh, what our team uh, does and a bit of our infrastructure. Uh, then I'll tell you how we basically populate the information into Netbox uh, with the, uh, our rack creation process, as that's the first step on our automation pipeline. So we have uh, many automation use cases which involve Netbox, but I've selected this one as an example because that's the uh, initial step on, uh, on our automation efforts. And I hope that maybe uh, someday I'll have another pre presentation here that I can uh, uh, show you other, other automation use cases that we have. And in the end, I'll have a demo of this, uh, this rack creation process. So a few words about the um, NESC. So our team is uh, Nokia Engineering and Services Cloud. So that's uh, Nokia's internal private cloud offering. So we provide uh, OpenStack, Kubernetes, storage, bare metal databases as a service. And if I would need to describe our team with uh, one sentence, so we provide cost efficient cloud uh, computing for uh, Nokia's internal use. So uh, NESC was initiated back in 2010 uh, with a few servers and uh, it has been steadily growing uh, year by year. So we are currently, we have uh, seven data centers, uh, roughly 400 racks, uh, 12,000 devices, 720k uh, uh, cores, uh, 50 petabytes of storage and roughly 5,000 accounts. And we have been using uh, Netbox in production since 2017, and we started it off with the uh, with the network devices, but the rest of the infra was taken into scope uh, rather soon after. And we use uh, pretty much all the features uh, Netbox provides, and we have uh, uh, rather many uh, integrations with Netbox, like uh, uh, we generate configurations, uh, we integrate with the DNS, DHCP, dynamic inventories, we enrich log events with the Netbox data, and so on. And then about the how we populate the data into Netbox. So our uh, rack creation process. So as our infrastructure is rather large, so automation is a must, and also uh, defining the source of truths are is also a must. So this means that we need to document everything first to Netbox before we deploy anything to uh, to production. And in case, uh, the most common uh, use case is adding new resources, uh, start by adding a new rack to, to Netbox. And the uh, initial steps for uh, creating a new rack is uh, uh, regardless of the rack role, so whether it will be on the OpenStack or Kubernetes, uh, we need to add the rack itself. Uh, we need to add the devices into rack, uh, uh, document the power and interface cabling, uh, allocate IP addresses and prefixes. And uh, then uh, depending on the on the use case of the rack, we add like tags, AS numbers, assigning config context and, and so on as, uh, for that specific deployment type. And if we think about the uh, typical rack, uh, we have servers, of course, uh, we have PDUs, uh, interface and power connections, uh, IP addresses and prefixes and so on. And if we would do this kind of operation via the GUI, uh, it would be uh, like a more than 400 operations. So it would be time consuming, boring, and uh, very error prone. So it's basically impossible to create this uh, manually via the GUI. And the only option is basically to create this, uh, um, this documentation with the code. And it's very important to make it right as the basically the rest of the automation relies uh, on, this, on this information. So we have a lot of history behind us. So we have a multi-vendor environment. Uh, we have multiple device types, multiple different rack layouts, different cabling, and so on. So uh, and we have uh, different uh, rack types, like a compute, storage, uh, GPU racks. 
And we started tackling this, uh, this issue by uh, creating templates for these data models, uh, which are then processed with the uh, Python script and the data is uh, then uh, uh, based on that created into, uh, into Netbox. So basically one template uh, uh, um, creates the devices that are in the rack and how they are positioned in the rack. Uh, the second template basically uh, defines how we uh, want it, the devices to be cabled. And the third one uh, describes how the IP addresses and prefixes should be uh, allocated. And there are other, um, other templates as well, but this is just the um, uh, common to all the, all the racks. So we created these uh, uh, first scripts uh, over the REST API, but we started using uh, custom scripts as this feature became available. And uh, for those who are not familiar with the custom scripts, uh, it's a feature that allows you to run your uh, own code within the Netbox app. And we selected custom scripts over the REST API because of the uh, nice integration with the Netbox GUI, uh, the speed and support for transactions. So if we would run the similar feature over the uh, REST API, you would need to take certain exceptions into account, for example, that if the, uh, let's say, connection fails in the middle of rack creation, you might uh, end up with the half-baked rack. And here's the example of, uh, uh, of the uh, templates that we use for uh, creating the racks. So it's a YAML file. Uh, it describes the uh, rack dimensions, rack role, uh, the devices in the, in the rack, and, uh, and what kind of uh, cabling templates uh, we should use. And we also define here the, uh, the PDUs as non-racked devices. And uh, then we have the uh, cabling templates. So this is a uh, CSV file, uh, which basically uh, each line represents one cable. So there's a definition of that, that um, uh, the U position of the device, then the uh, interfaces and the label that we want to add to the, to the cable and of course the cable type. And similar CSV file for the, uh, for the power cables. Uh, so it defines the PDU, uh, uh, the power outlets and the device position and the PSU. And uh, we have another script for uh, allocating the IP addresses and uh, there are certain uh, parameters that the, that the user needs to enter to get the uh, IP address allocation done correctly. And the, uh, the template for the um, allocating the IP addresses uh, is a YAML file. And there's a basically a logic that how to allocate first the, uh, the prefix. So for example, in this case, it's uh, allocating a slash uh, 26 prefix from a, from a parent prefix that has a role OOB and the tenant is shared. And then we allocate the IP addresses um, from, that, uh, from that prefix and uh, allocation is done based on the uh, device position in the, in the rack. And this is a slightly uh, simplified example of uh, how we allocate the IP addresses, but the logic is, uh, is the same as we have in, in production. And then I'll have a short demo of this setup. Uh, so um, we have this uh, uh, script for uh, creating the rack. So we first select the, uh, the templates, uh, which should be, should be used. Uh, we specify the, uh, the site, uh, the location, where this uh, rack is located, and we give the name for the, um, for the rack. We also document the uh, asset tax and the purchase order. So this has to be some uh, uh, unique numbers. And then uh, we also document the power and uh, how, how the uh, rack is connected to the, uh, to the power panels. So we need to, be, need to select those. And in this case, uh, I'll just uh, use the uh, try run feature. So uh, uh, just to test it out that everything works fine. Uh, so it doesn't, uh, push any changes to the, um, or write any changes to the, to the database. And this should take roughly 30 seconds to run, and then we can actually, actually create, create that rack. And this is, uh, this try run feature is a rather nice uh, feature to test it out so that, that there, for example, isn't any, any, uh, any issues, for example, running out of IP addresses or stuff like that. And this one takes uh, when when you, uh, on this uh, uh, my dev instance uh, or demo instance, it will take like uh, uh, roughly uh, one minute or one and a half minutes. So if you have any questions right now, uh, just uh, let me know while we wait to just to complete. I I have a, a general question. So how long were you 
sort of doing this process manually before you decided that a script was a, a better approach? Because I love seeing script use. Uh, we basically did it from the beginning. Oh, smart. <laughs> Okay, so now it was created and uh, we should have like N12. And we have the rack here. Uh, it was created and we have the, uh, the PDUs, uh, all the cabling is done there as well. And, and the connections cables have the correct labels and so on. And then we can uh, just run the other script for the IP address allocation. Uh, and 12, and in this case, there's only one, one template for, for this one, and we can just run this one. And everything looks okay. Very nice. And if we then select the rack and let's pick up one device from there and uh, we get to the to the prefix and I just want to show that uh, these are the IP addresses that were basically allocated for the rack. Cool. Awesome. That's um, all from my side. To Mo, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this with us. It's really cool to see how Nokia is doing this uh, inside of your data center setups. It's, um, again, I like script utilization. It, sometimes it's hard to figure out what's the right fit and feel for a script, but it seems like you, you all have been able to do that really well. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to breeze through our closing here pretty quickly because I know we have some questions with about nine minutes left. So um, obviously, thank you, Ian, Austin, and Tumo. Um, We're going to share a quick survey in the chat here. Uh, if, if you all could uh, take a moment to fill that out, just give us feedback on the event today. We would really appreciate that. Uh, we'll also make sure that comes out through the emails as well. Um, also wanted to call out one of our maintainers. Um, his name is Abi Saharan. Uh, he put in what was it, it's 27 pull requests in the past 30 days, and we've merged 23 of those in. So that's been uh, great to see uh, some some good effort out there within the community, uh, within the maintainer pool, helping us bring NetBox a little bit forward. So. Uh, let's go ahead and jump in to Q and A's. Uh, like I said, I'm pretty sure we're going to have a couple. So anyone who wants to come on mic uh, or throw your question in chat, I can read it out loud. But let's jump into Q and A for uh, any of our presenters. All right, I'll start. Um, Austin, for the 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 bits that you've put together there, and you answered a bit of this in chat as far as being uh, willing to open source parts of that. How long did it take you to develop and put that together? So there were two components. Um, definitely the biggest pain by far was the fact that SolarWinds really doesn't give you an SDK. Uh, the SDK they give you is like a thin wrapper around a pretty obtuse and inscrutable and undocumented, mostly undocumented API. And so um, knowing that that was going to have to just be my baby, whether I liked it or not, I dove right into building um, a more object based one. So you can, you know, now get a node as an object and you can modify it like, you know, in a Pythonic way. Um, really hoping to open source that by the end of the year. So far, it looks like I have some support there because that's just a huge win for everybody. Um, not having to figure out their like verb syntax and, you know, undocumented options and all that. Uh, the other side, though, was the webhook processing. Um, so translating a webhook payload. Um, and by the way, the webhook payloads are really straightforward and very well structured as far as I could tell. You, you get a you get a pre-change, you get a post-change, you get a current state, you get pretty much everything you would need. And I thought, oh, this will be easy to translate into an event that I can then pass on to SolarWinds. And it was a very humbling experience, let's just say, uh, because 
so many corner cases, so many things are still coming up like a year later. Um, most of it works just fine, uh, but definitely trying to get the right paradigm for, hey, I'm, I'm receiving this webhook. How can I ascertain what has changed, if anything? Um, also issues like making sure that we don't do anything for things that we don't really care about. So filtering out events sure. that SolarWinds doesn't need to know about. All those things have been taking some time. So uh, yeah, hoping to open source that too. Uh, um, my webhook process was very basic. Uh, I think that somebody mentioned in the chat, there's probably a hundred better ways of doing that, like with Redis, yeah, I'm just interested in that. But um, at least the logic part of translating the webhook into a decision or you know an event, I would like to share that. And if I can do that, I will uh, go out on Slack and do that. Yeah, I mean, that would be phenomenal. And that's a great collaborative space for things like that, especially if you're open sourcing it. So please drop in and, and share when you do have that. Yeah, I'm pushing for it. And so far, it seems like I have some support on my end. But uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Cool. Uh, there's a question out of chat from Steve to Timo. Uh, do you add device serial numbers manually, import them automatically or not at all or not deal with them at all? Yeah, well, we have a custom script for adding the serial numbers as well, but uh, I left it out from this presentation due to time constraints. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see here. There's some other comments. Uh, if anybody does have any other questions, uh, please feel free to hop on and ask. Oh, there's another one in there for Timo. Uh, did you gooify the YAML creation process? No, we uh, modified the uh, the files directly because um, uh, in most of the cases, it's just like uh, 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 replacing the device types. Uh, but um, but in more, more complex cases, it might require that we also change the, the cabling logic. But, uh, but it's just uh, uh, modifying directly the, the files. Gotcha, OK. Yeah, and the files are in, in Git. <laughs> For anyone who uh, missed that, it was a question through chat. <laughs> yeah. Any anyone else? Going once, going twice. Actually, um, I'd like to answer one of the questions Ed had asked. Um, sure. Think of mine, um, and just as a refresher for the question, um, was he's Ed asks. I guess you are managing multiple identity auth management models at Boston Children's. Are you looking to combine these into a single SSO solution or would you like to? Um, the link that was provided is usually that's a light that's um, a lighthouse feature, uh, which we do use primarily for um, more as a matter of convenience, uh, because it is, you know, before the arrival of NetBox made it easier for any of the operators to find out, okay, what console server is this device on? Uh, the search has been really good. Um, however, for the terminal servers themselves, um, which use a direct log on for TACX, I don't really think we have really a separate uh, SAML type of solution for that. So. Um, and from a security perspective, all of those network administrative credentials are separate from, let's say, our AD credentials that we use for most of the other systems in the enterprise. So, um, not really looking to do any other anything else that's crazy because it's uh, on the per endpoint basis. So, sure. I hope that answers that question. Thanks for picking up on that one, Ian. I had missed that. All right, well, uh, we do have about a little under two minutes left. If nobody has any other questions. Nope. All right. So again, appreciate everyone joining. Uh, the link to the survey is in chat. Please take a moment to fill that out. Uh, that really helps us guide where these sessions go in the future. Uh, so thank you for joining us one more time. We'll see everybody next month. Have a good day. <laughs>